This morning, the committee is meeting with representatives from the Neurological Alliance of Ireland, the HSE, the Disabilities Federation of Ireland, and Alcohol Forum to hear their insights into services for those living with a neurological condition and of the problems they may encounter in providing those being provided with those services. On behalf of the committee, I would now like to welcome from the Neurological Society of Ireland, Ms. Edina O'Driscoll, Project Manager, Neuro Rehabilitation Demonstration Project, and uh, Madeleine Rogers, Executive Director. From the Disability Federation of Ireland, Ms. Joanne McCar McCarty, Senior Executive Policy and Research, and Ms. Eva Battles, Chief Executive, Multiple Sources of Ireland. And finally, from the Alcohol Forum, Dr. Helen McMonagall, Special, Specialist Care Coordinator in Alcohol-Related Brain Injury, and Ms. Paula Leonard, National Lead on Community Action and Alcohol Programme. You're all welcome. Thank you. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses who are are protect, protected by absolute privilege in respect to their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after the meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against any person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Can I now ask Ms Rogers to make your opening statement? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Chair and members of the Committee for including the issue of services for people with neurological conditions in their work plan for providing the opportunity to speak on this theme this morning. I'd like to introduce Adina O'Driscoll, Project Manager for the Neuro Rehabilitation Demonstrator Project. She's here in a voluntary capacity at our invitation, specifically to address any queries in relation to the project which I mentioned in the course of my statement. Over 800,000 Irish people are living with neurological conditions, ranging from common conditions such as migraine, dementia and epilepsy to rare neurological disease, with approximately 40,000 additional people diagnosed each year. The Neurological Alliance of Ireland is a national advocacy group for neurological care, representing over 30 patient organisations. We work closely with the Disability Federation of Ireland in promoting recognition of the need for community supports for people living with neurological conditions, and the vital role played by voluntary organisations in this regard, including MS Ireland. I want to briefly highlight an issue that I don't have sufficient time to deal with in detail here, but continues to impact significantly on people with neurological conditions, including multiple sclerosis, and that is the issue of access to medicines. NAI supports the call by the Medical Research Charities Group and the Irish Platform for Patient Science and Industry for the development and implementation of a national strategy on access to new and innovative medicines in Ireland. The remainder of my statement will focus on the specific challenges in accessing neurology and neurorehabilitation services and call for investment in a series of specific projects which we in NAI could make, believe could make a significant positive impact. Neurorehabilitation services are critical to support recovery and prevent disability for people with neurological conditions. The ongoing lack of access to specialist rehabilitation in this country continues to have a devastating impact on individuals and their families, resulting in unnecessary disability and, and impinging on the precious potential for recovery. Ireland has less than half of the specialist inpatient beds needed for a population of its size, and community-based services are totally underdeveloped, with only three community health organisations having dedicated, but still only partially staffed, community neurorehabilitation teams. A three-year implementation framework for the 2011 National Policy and Strategy for, the Neuro for Neuro Rehabilitation Services was finally published by the HSE in February 2019. While implementation of this framework is, in is included as a key action within the Sloan Care Implementation Plan, this will be impossible without dedicated funding. A critical starting point is the need for investment in the Neuro Rehabilitation Demonstrator Project. <coughs> This project is an innovative collaboration between acute hospitals, the National Rehabilitation Hospital, Royal Hospital, Donnybrook, Piedmont Healthcare, local voluntary providers and primary care to develop a managed clinical rehabilitation network which will improve access to specialist neurorehabilitation for people in CHOs 6 and 7. 
This is not just about introducing a new service. This pilot project is fully in line with the aims of staunch care to provide an integrated approach to the management of chronic neurological conditions, reducing length of stay in acute hospitals, saving bed days, and most importantly, making sure people receive the right care in the right place where they need it. I now want to move on to a series of proposed projects to address the challenges in neurology services. The Neurology Clinical Programme recognises that over 20,000 patients are waiting for neurological evaluation at present, of, of whom at least 30% suffer from headache. Headache represents the second most frequent condition presenting to acute medical assessment units. In response to this, in collaboration with the Irish Pharmacy Union, the Migrant Association of Ireland, the Neurology Programme has developed a new pathway of care that will expedite headache management to a community-focused model in an innovative, quality-driven and cost-effective way in, in line with the aims of Sloan's care. The Neurology Programme also recognises that many neuro neurological diseases are rare, requiring national centres of expertise. So, an innovative, agile and sustainable management plan has been developed using, the motor, using motor neuron disease as a model that integrates care across the hospital and community and capitalises on the expertise of the voluntary sector to provide high-quality, evidence-based, streamlined care for patients from diagnosis to end of life. Third and finally, the Neurology Programme recognised the importance of providing evidence-based disease-modifying treatments in a cost-effective manner for neurological disease. The programme is developing an evidence-based treatments pathway for multiple sclerosis that can be replicated for other neurological diseases, for which new, highly effective but costly treatments are anticipated. In conclusion, the Neurological Alliance are calling for investment in the initiatives outlined this morning as a key opportunity to begin to address the huge challenges faced by Irish people living with neurological conditions. All the proposals are fully cost and ready for implementation and detailed descriptions have already been circulated to the committee or are available on request. Finally, the Neurological Alliance wishes to stress that a commitment to ongoing investment in neurology and neurorehabilitation services needs to be a key part of any future programme for government, and we look forward to working with committee members in shaping policy. Thank you very much, um, Madeleine. Our next opening statement is from Ms McCarthy, please. No, actually... I call for we're going to speak next. Okay, okay. Possible. sorry. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman, Senators, Deputies and members of the Committee. We are very grateful for the invitation to attend today to address the Committee and represent the needs of two groups of people. Those individuals and families affected by a spectrum of neurocognitive disorders known as alcohol-related brain injury or ARBI and those impacted by a collection of neurodevelopmental disorders widely referred to as fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I am joined by my colleague Paula Leonard from the Alcohol Forum and we are a national charity that provides support, information and services for people, families and community impacted by alcohol harm. I myself am Dr Helen McMonigal and I speak firstly in my capacity as a rehabilitation coordinator for people affected by a condition that is largely excluded in many national dialogues around alcohol, disability and neurorehabilitation in Ireland. Alcohol related brain injury is a brain injury that is acquired as a result of the toxic effect of alcohol in the brain and the nutritional deficiencies and malnutrition that often accompany this pattern of alcohol use. Over the last seven years of providing support for this condition, I have seen firsthand the devastating range of brain-based difficulties that result from ARBI, including difficulties with memory, attention, planning, reasoning, judgment, all of which interfere with the person's ability to lead an independent life. It prevents them over, from overcoming problems with addiction and exposes them to a range of personal and social vulnerabilities, including risks to their health, safety and personal well-being. This perfect storm of addiction and reduced cognitive capabilities alongside poor identification rates results in a vicious cycle of repeated hospital admissions and worsening prognoses for people affected. Four recent reports, the intercollegiate report from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, general practitioners, physicians and neurologists in England and Northern Ireland, reports from the Scottish Executive, Public Health Wales and the Welsh Government, highlight the growing concerns surrounding the increasing numbers of young men and women in their 40s, 50s and 60s developing this brain injury as a result of alcohol use and calls for support services to be urgently developed to meet their rehabilitative needs. 
Our local research, which we have recently submitted to you, and ongoing work to support people in the CHO1 area, continues to highlight the health service limbo in which these individuals exist a condition which belongs to no one HSE directorate and a condition for which there is no leadership, strategic planning or care pathways for in our country. This is very difficult to comprehend when a recent review of the numbers approximates this condition has a €6 million Euro burden in three acute hospitals in the CHO1 area over the last five years. It has been shown internationally to contribute significantly to the burden of dementia, particularly early onset dementia, a large portion of homeless population, and affects between 0.4 and 2.8 per cent of the general population, or one in eight people dependent on alcohol. The committee needs to know that people with A or BI have no natural advocates. They won't self-present to their GP or local TD or media to highlight the inequities that exist for this condition. There is no professional group in Ireland taking the, the baton and speaking on their behalf. Our work with local services in Donegal has mirrored the findings of many other sites internationally that providing targeted supports in this area results in better outcomes for people affected and also re results in a reduction of the cost burden of this condition. Having just one case coordinator, a local care pathway and a willingness among local services to work with this condition in our county, we have freed up the equivalent of one bed in our local hospital for two and a half years, using 939 less bed days, or in cost terms, Letterkenny University Hospital has spent €850,000 less than Sligo University Hospital and €700,000 less than Cavan General Hospital responding to this condition over the last five years. We know that the detrimental impact of this condition extends beyond the people of Donegal and is a problem across the whole island of Ireland. I am here today to make one request that this committee mirrors the efforts of the Scottish Executive, Welsh Government and intercollegiate efforts in the UK in supporting the establishment of a national working group to scope the needs of this population in an Irish context and then to deliver recommendations and a strategy to this committee as to the best way to respond to the growing needs of this population. Without this scrutiny and oversight, my fear is that people with A or BI will continue to perish away in silence, being passed between pillar and post, with each service directorate saying, this problem does not belong to me, all the while spending millions on ineffective delayed discharges at an acute level. We know from international work that it doesn't need to be like this. Challenging this issue is a win-win for everybody involved, and we hope that you will give this request due consideration in proportion to the scale and size of the problem we face with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Paula, yes. I'm here today to speak to you about what is likely one of the most stigmatised of all health issues. In that context, I want to begin by saying that fetal, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are not the result of an uncaring act. No mother intends to cause harm to her child. There are complex reasons why women continue to drink or drink during pregnancy, and I hope that we might return to those later in the discussion. Prenatal alcohol exposure is the leading cause of preventable intellectual disability in the world. More children are born every year with FASD than with autism spectrum disorder, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome and SIDS combined. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are, um, are brain-based impairments resulting from prenatal alcohol exposure. Alcohol has been documented as a toxic teratogenic substance for over 40 years. It passes freely through the placenta during pregnancy and results in a range of learning and neurological disabilities. Behavioural deficits, difficulties with regulation of mood and behaviour, cognitive deficits and impaired executive functioning. As outlined in page 3 of your submission, people with FASD are at an, an increased risk of a range of difficulties across their lifespan. More than half will serve jail sentences or be confined in drug treatment or psychiatric facilities as adults. Prison experience for people with FASD needs to be understood within a context. Many of those with FASD have difficulties with impulse control, 
They have an inability to learn from punishment and discipline, and they have difficulty with understanding or adhering to rules. 92% of all those with the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder will receive a secondary formal mental health diagnosis. Although FASDs themselves are permanent, diagnosis, early intervention and support have been proven to mitigate um, associated risks, including poor mental health, addiction and suicide. Early diagnosis can help to identify other associated health conditions. 428 co-occurring conditions have been identified across 127 studies of children impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure. These include epilepsy, heart defects, compromised auditory function and compromised immune system. In an international review last year, Ireland was featured as one of five countries with the highest prevalence of fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome, or FAS, is the most severe end of the FASD spectrum with the greatest alcohol effects, including physical malformations. It is estimated that 600 babies are born um, with fetal alcohol syndrome each year in Ireland and that 40,000 Irish persons are living with the condition. If those estimates are correct, the numbers of those impacted by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, ranging from mild to severe, could be 10 times that number, as international evidence indicates that for every case of FAS, there are at least 10 cases of FASD. We're delighted to be here in the context of a review of neurological supports and services in Ireland. The WHO recommends that action is needed to deal with neurological disorders associated with the consumption of toxic compounds, including alcohol. A number of recommendations to this committee are made um, on page four of your submission. Um, but for us, the key recommendation is that we need to have clear clinical guidelines for the diagnosis of FASD agreed and developed in this country. Development and adoption of clear diagnostic criteria will assist clinicians in assignment of more accurate diagnoses of FASD and will pave the way to more widespread early intervention, improved prevention efforts and cost savings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Leonard. And now, um, Joanne McCarthy, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you everybody for giving us the opportunity today to come and talk with our colleagues around the importance of new rehabilitation services. Um, I know many of you, so I don't want to go back into the big spiel about who DFI is. Just suffice to say that we're an umbrella organisation who supports over 120 disability organisations and works with many more outside of that. We provide information, training, networking, advocacy and um, representation, research and policy development and organisational development. I suppose... Um, I wanted to start with by just opening the conversations about do we all understand who it is when we talk about who the disabled are in Ireland. According to the census in, 20, in 2016, there's 13.5% of the population have self-diagnosed as having a disability. Um, and one in four of those people um, acquire a disability of working age. And this means that for most people with disabilities, they're already married, they're already working, they already have a job, and they're already living in their own homes and in their communities. Um, I suppose once the onset of disability occurs, timely access to new rehabilitation services post the onset um, ensures that the condition will be um, that the condition will directly impact, will have less of a direct impact on their lives and on the lives of their families. Um, and for this reason, we fully endorse the Neurological Alliance of Ireland's um, call for an investment in neurorehabilitation services. However, and for those of you who know DFI, you know our brand. Um, for us, um, to do that alone is, will only do half of the job. For most people, and if you look at those numbers again, most people with disabilities will continue to live in their own homes and in their own communities. Whilst they may have a short-term intervention um, in terms of acute services, they will return to their communities. And unless we invest in a solid community services program that it supports them and their families to live and navigate the world of this neurological condition, then we are putting money in false places. Um, I suppose we should also just take some time to consider at present where is and what is the disability spend doing at present. So we know that there's 1.9 billion spent on disability services in 2019. Of that, 85% of the spend will go directly towards supporting 8,500 people um, through a range of residential supports and services and 27,000 people through a range of day supports and services. 
we're not undermining or we're not questioning the need for these people to receive that support. But I suppose it's important for us to understand that, that there's a very small cohort of the disability population is soaking up quite a large amount of the disability spend. Um, I was just, I gave you a copy of um, th these figures, I suppose, reinforce a copy of a report that was, pu that was, that was done for the um, Value for Money and Policy Review of Disability Services for the, for the Department of Health. And in that, you can see that less than 10% of the funding is directed towards community services programs, such as personal assistance, respite, day services, and other services. And that is where a lot of the community new rehabilitation services are, are, are involved. Um, community services and supports are mostly um, co-funded by a range of disability organisations, and my colleague Ava will give you a good sense of what that means. And many of these are um, condition-specific. Um, they help individuals and families to navigate the diagnosis and develop st strategies for self-management, um, access to a range of, of um, services such as acute and primary, um, primary care services, housing services, social welfare services, local education and training services, because oftentimes these people have to retrain and reskill in order to go back to work. Um, so, Whilst we endorse and fully support the call for the acute neurorehabilitation services, we're also calling for an un a better understanding and investment in this range of very specific community services. And these include home, um, home supports, family supports, um, health and wellbeing. Look, Ava will go through them um, um, further. Um, so over to you, Ava, and then I'll just do a quick summation. Good afternoon. Uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Ireland is uh, established since 1961 and in that 58 years since its foundation our mission has evolved to support people with multiple sclerosis in the rapidly changing therapeutic, social, political and economic environment. We are the only national organisation that provides information, support and advocacy services to the MS community. And our mission is to enable and empower people affected by MS to live the life of their choice to their fullest potential. We receive 52% of our funding from the state and 48% we uh, get through fundraising initiatives. We're very cognizant of the lack of neurorehabilitation available to people with MS and a wide range of other neurological conditions. We're also very aware that MS and other progressive neurological conditions can have both physical and psychological consequences, which may have an enormous long-term impact on almost every aspect of the daily lives of those affected. Uh, being aware of that and obviously everything that Mags and uh, Joanne have said, we believe as a voluntary organisation we have a variety of creative and dynamic ways to mitigate the deficits that have been mentioned and I'd like to just take you through two or three of those. So one is our exercise related activity programmes that are run in the community. As Joanne has said, most people after their diagnosis come back out and live in their community. When we won Tesco Charity of the Year a number of years ago, that money was put into a research project with the University of Limerick, the physiotherapy department. The results of the research clearly demonstrated to affect change in an MS population, physical activity needed to be delivered with frequency and intensity to maintain that change. The results also show that when people stopped, they returned to a baseline or often worsened. Now, we know from the research that a person with MS will probably, if they're lucky, and it's on an ad hoc basis, may receive one hour worth of physiotherapy from the state in their local community. And that is if they can get out of their home and travel to that physiotherapy class. And that is actually if they can get into the physiotherapy class, because a lot of the places where they're being run are not accessible. So we do know we have an issue. We provide around €200,000 of fundraised income a year into the provision of the delivery of these physiotherapy and exercise related programmes. So in 2018, 1,802 people accessed these programmes in the 26 counties. They're also, the delivery of these programmes is also supported by the Department of Social Protection. So what we have is community employment programmes where we have people on a back-to-work programme where they train to become um, physiotherapy assistants. So the physiotherapist does the assessment with the person in the community and those physiotherapy assistants who are trained will go out to the person in the community on a weekly basis and actually do the physio class with that person. So that is somebody who may not be able to get out of their house because they don't have transport from their rural location into the, the community or somebody um, who just doesn't have access to, to be able to do that or somebody who may not actually feel like they're 
able to do that because of fatigue. So our physio assistants will go into the house and we know from the research that is clearly saying that it's not only the actual physical activity that improves their um, uh, mental health and physical health but also the interaction with people and that social engagement. So that, those physio programs came out of that initial research program and they're being delivered throughout the country. However, we've now continued that relationship with the University of Limerick and we've developed offer two, ne two new evidence-based programs which have a focus on prevention. And these, uh, these programs are being run through funding that we have received where somebody wants to um, restrict their funding to research initiatives. The first one I'd like to tell you about is Step It Up. It's a physiotherapy-led exercise and education program that is designed to improve symptoms through knowledge, exercise participation and coaching. It's primarily designed for people who are currently inactive, have minimal walking problems and are relatively recently diagnosed with the condition. And its central aim is to encourage participants to address and plan for their physical activity needs. So let's put this into reality. You take, um, I'll call this person Mary, who's a 24-year-old female who is a nurse. She has a diagnosis of MS and is extremely struggling to maintain her daily uh, activity in her work and is finding it really, really difficult. She comes to our community worker and who, uh, for an assessment. The reality for her is she is just about able to work during her week when she comes home in the evening she has to go to bed and she is exhausted and takes the weekend to recover. She's referred to one of the Step It Up programmes and Mary, I can tell you now, uh, based on a 12 week programme, is running with her dog and as of last week was running up a hill as part of one of her... Ex and this is real, I mean it's, 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 we, can spout, we can spout statistics all we want but I suppose I wanted to try and make it real for every one of the programmes to actually take it where this is a this is a person who is now no longer concerned about being able to work, is no longer looking at retiring at 27, who is actively participating, contributing to society, paying her taxes and now has a better quality of life. The other program, Better Balance, is a physiotherapy-led exercise and education program that is designed to improve balance and reduce falls. It is suited to people who have recently experienced a fall or who are afraid of falling. Now, this does not just apply to people with MS, but obviously it is related from our point of view to, to people with MS. Its central aim is to encourage the self-reflection of participants in their daily life to avoid falls. 44-year-old female who has retired from her employment due to her multiple sclerosis had fallen three times in a two-year period and had had three fractures. She has not fallen in the last 12 weeks. She is now going back out and socialising. Um, but as I say, you have to look at it from her point of view, 44, retired, um, and these programmes are enabling her to participate in her community and again increasing her quality of life. Then what we have done is taken all that research that I have mentioned in those two programmes and now we have turned that into an Activities Matter programme which is available to somebody um, on a website. So you can avail of it through um, your own home as long as you have an internet connection. Um, so you can be, uh, you try and be <laughs> as... Uh, <laughs> so uh, to enable them to be more active and participate in their community. So again, it's about us as an organisation trying to look at what are the needs for people on the ground and trying to develop programmes that actually work for people when they are back in their community. Um, I would just like to briefly mention two other programmes. The, we have a 12-bed respite facility which operates here in Dublin where people come from all over the country. And not only, I suppose, is it a place where a person can get an MSNCT, um, but it is also an opportunity for those carers who are looking after people with multiple sclerosis on a daily basis to get a break while the person stays with us for a 5, 7 or 12 night stay. And the final programme I'd like to mention is just to bring in the point of working collaboratively with our other um, organisations. We do a piece of work with Rehab Care in the West of Ireland. Unfortunately, this is only available in the West of Ireland, where um, the HSE provide funding to Rehab Care um, for people with cognitive rehabilitation. So again, a person comes in to us, they meet our community worker, we identify that there are cognitive issues for that person. They then are referred to the Rehab Care Cognitive Programme where they have an assessment, a 12-week programme, and again, improving the quality of life for people who are, um, have MS and in the community. So what's, all that's left for me to say really is from an organisation who provides services to people in the community, we 110% support both the NAI and the DFI's recommendations to this committee today. Thank you.
Great. Thank you. Just a few um, words just to count up. I should just say that um, any of our fellow organisations that are sitting patiently up in the gallery today could also tell similar stories. So we have, I know we've migraine, we have acquired brain injury, and they also run equally, they run community-based programmes that facilitate um, and support people to keep healthy. I suppose just to conclude, what DFI is looking for is whilst we, uh, uh, we continue to endorse the calls that have come from NAI, but we have two specific things. First of all, that we are looking to secure 200, mil, um, 200 um, a multi-annual investment program of 200 million um, to um, over a five-year period to bed down um, community-based resources and infrastructure that support people to continue to live with conditions in their own homes and in their, as best they can in their communities. We are also looking for you to commit to the development of a strategy um, for community services and supports that brings a coherence to this work, that joins this work up with um, the new rehabilitation strategy, the value for money program, um, the primary care strategy, and that it brings that coherence across, so that when people um, on the ground with conditions, that they are experiencing a seamless in and out of services, and that we're looking for you to endorse that. I suppose we're just uh, we're reminding you that there are over 600 100,000 people with disabilities in Ireland that are depending on, on these types of services, not on residential and not on day services, but on these types of services, and they are happening. That is one in four of us today will probably end up depending on these types of services. And what we're asking is for your commitment to supporting the development of the services that they need on a daily basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms McCarthy and Ms Battles. So we're now going to uh, ask for contributions from our members. So the first member is Deputy Margaret Murphy. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, I'd like to welcome you all in here this morning and to thank you for the Trojan and wonderful work that all your organisations do. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that you're all female. I don't think I've ever sat here with a full panel of female witnesses, so go girls. Great, great, to, see, great to see you all. Um, so the World Health Organization has stated that providing adequate services to help people with neurological conditions is one of the greatest challenges facing public health systems. But that said, I suppose we, we're only concentrating obviously on, on the Irish system here, but I suppose it has to be acknowledged that it is, it is a worldwide um, problem for the want of a better word. Chair, can I just confirm with you if someone from the HSC was invited here this morning? Um. I had mentioned that in my introduction, but I, I, don't, I don't think we did. I, I, I don't think so. Okay, but, um, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah maybe is going it, forward. Is for, sorry, for is it that Adina is here in her personal capacity, but you're actually... I'm, I'm here as project manager for the demonstrator project yeah. for the new rehab strategy so only. But you have a connection yeah. with the HSE. Yes. Yes, yes so that's yes. the... But I'm not representing... That clarifies what you're not yeah. representing. Yeah. 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 So going forward, if we have a group of witnesses like this, um, essentially you're speaking to the converted, I think, here a lot. And I think it would be important if we had someone who could actually um, take up your points and and work on work on them going forward. So I suppose it's a lesson for us, you know. Um, I'm sure they're looking in, but we can send yes. them a transcript and ask them for their Say comments. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think that's important, Deputy Manning, because we, we're bringing a series of proposed initiatives, and it would be useful to know where that that is in terms of the decision making. Yes, I, I agree with you there. Yeah. So my first question really um, is: um, so in in the southern part of Ireland. There is no dedicated specialist medical rehabilitation for people with neurological conditions. It's, um, I suppose most things in life, unfortunately, are, are Dublin-centred, but with something as important as, as this, it, I think it, it is very um, disappointing that we have nothing to the south of the country. So m my first question was to ask you all, what is needed in the south of the country? Um, and unfortunately, I did think there was someone from the HSE going to be here, and I was going to ask them what are they going to do about it, essentially. So, but maybe Staley could answer the first part of the question um, just in a few sentences. If you had a magic wand, what, what is required in the south of the country, please? Um, but it would, it would be a long-standing recommendation of, of the, the Neurological Alliance, Deputy Murphy, that I should be aware of, that there is a need for a specialist rehabilitation centre. Cork is the second national neuroscience centre in, in the country and neurosurgical centre. 
and the, the long-standing fact that it doesn't have a dedicated specialist rehabilitation um, unit. Um, that would, it, it would be a long-standing recommendation of the Neurological Alliance that there would be access to specialist rehabilitation provided in that region. The, the National Neuro Rehabilitation Strategy makes a number of recommendations in relation to development of special, specialist neuro rehabilitation facilities and bringing Ireland up to the minimum standard in terms of the number of specialist beds it should have. So that is certainly something that we would recommend and endorse that such a facility would be provided. Now I think the, the number of beds, the location, all of that needs to be decided operationally and in conjunction with the rollout of the National Trauma Strategy. So the location of <laughs> the location of um, those beds and what facility they would be in, but certainly the need is, is very clear and has been clear for some time. Thank you. Just, uh, the new rehabilitation strategy would say that there's a requirement for 60 specialist inpatient beds per million of population and uh, community new rehab team per CHO of population around half a million. Okay. Thank you. Coming from an up a number um, of the intercollegiate reports completed and the best practices cited around the world would be for the need for a specialist transitional unit in the community to facilitate early hospital discharge and to free up beds at an acute level as well. Uh, what we know is that when people with ARBI receive specialist rehabilitation, their prognosis at, at, in the long term is far better and the outcomes for the, at the person is far better than if they get rehabilitation in a more generalist setting. Okay, thank you. And this was just a few points of, um, of information that you obviously know that um, obviously there's a chronic lack of investment right, right across the board with regard to these services and just to point out that half the number of specialist rehabilitation beds, um, so we have only half the recommended number for a population of our size. And also we have the lowest number of consultants in rehabilitation medicine in Europe. So I, I just think that that again is very disappointing. And uh, just a few questions please for the Alcohol Forum. I suppose I am very familiar with the other organisations and have worked with them. I'm not as familiar with yours. And just reading, um, reading through what you sent us there, I, I think it's very, very disappointing, you know, that the lack of experience in the assessment and the stigma associated and and that there's 80 percent of people that are affected being um di diagnostically missed so if you could just expand on i think in this day and age that it, that i can't believe that there's still stigma Absolutely, yeah. and I don't think that's specific just to Ireland. That seems to be the case uh, worldwide in relation to this condition. It's only over the last 10 years where research in this area has really spiked, uh, given the increases in the numbers of people coming through with this condition. But what we do know um, by a recent research paper conducted by the Care Services Improvement Partnership uh, in the UK was that uh, among professionals there was a lack of diagnostic expertise among many professionals in relation to ARBI. There there was a lack of training on alcohol-related brain injury in many core professional groups. There was a lot of stigma uh, among professionals for this group as well, failing to see the underlying brain injury because they uh, believe that the challenging behaviours or the individual difficulties that the person had is due to their alcohol use rather than seeing that it might be a brain injury. So questioning, well, could there be something else going on for this person other than the alcohol use as well? And also as well, because there is a, a, you know, a consistent lack or a complete lack of resources in this area in Ireland as well, you know, that doesn't incentivize people to identify this condition because if they do identify them, what do they do with them then? You know, so, but what we know is that there is a huge amount that we can be doing to increase the identification rate and the best practice practice management of this particular condition as well. So we do need to be building up expertise in the recognition and management of this uh, group in addiction services, but also in acute services as well. Things like the routine screening for of uh, cognition and malnutrition in long-term heavy alcohol users as well would very much improve identification rates as, uh, too. And I think that that should be spurred on by the fact that prognosis for this condition is really good if we identify it early enough you know so yes. over 25 percent of people can make a full recovery yeah. mm -hmm. uh, another 25 percent can make a, a partial recovery and another uh, 25 percent will make a significant recovery okay and can i just ask you if a population need analysis has been done as part of the slaunter care 
Yeah, so we have um, we have undertaken local research to, deter or to determine the prevalence of this condition in the northwest region of Ireland. So we firstly looked at um, the numbers of hospital admissions for A or BI between the, the between the years of 2005 to 2009, and then we re-reviewed those numbers uh, for the period between 2012 and 2016. So in Letterkenny University Hospital, uh, between 2005 and 2009, there was 92 admissions for A or BI, and in Sligo University Hospital there were 71 admissions. Um, oh, sorry, is this a forming part of the Sloan to Care, or is it just it your is. own analysis? Okay. So when we reviewed the numbers um, in bet from between the period 2012-2016, there's been a 63% increase in the numbers of admissions for A or BI in Letterkenny, and a 121% increase in the numbers of admissions for A or BI in Sligo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Deputy so, Murphy. And just because we started our meeting late this morning, uh, we have to vacate this room at quarter to two. There are eight members here who want to contribute. So can I just ask members if they would ask one or two pertinent questions and allow the answers to go forwards and backwards so that we can allow everybody to contribute and still keep within our time. So sorry about the pressure of time. Uh, so, in relation to those then who are going to contribute, we have Rose Conway Walsh, who's stepping in for Deputy Louisa Riley. Then we have uh, Colin Burke, Senator John Dolan, uh, Bernard Durkin, and Kate O'Connell. And then we'll bring in our non members after that. It's so just to be conscious to give everybody an opportunity to be concise. Thank you. Senator Walsh. I'll be concise. We have uh, 16 neurologists, is it? In the country, and um, what is it? We're at 34 at this stage. At 34 now. How many should we have? We should have at least 42. Okay. And based on the U.S. in terms of the number of neurologists, yeah, 3.92. Sorry, I, I'm I'm going on old figures. We actually should have 68. Sorry about that. I'm going on the old percentages. Yeah. Well, it's actually 89.6 if you are basing it on the EU. But I suppose the key is that we have a real problem with shortage of neurologists. Yeah. And the waiting lists are completely unacceptable. So we can have, and I certainly welcome the strategies and all of that, but we can all, we can have all the strategies we want and all the plans we want. If we don't have enough neurologists, then we're not, the, the waiting lists are going to continue to, to increase. Do you see that there's going to be new um, neurologists appointed neurology posts done. I suppose that's my first question. Um, the other one is in terms of the National Rehab, uh, rehab Hospital. Um, were you surprised that the capacity wasn't increased there in order to meet the, um, uh, the waiting lists that were there? That's what, will I ask my, uh, my other questions? I need to ask you as well around Valparite. And I suppose the direct question for yourselves, so I would like if the HSC were here today, as well as do each of your organisations support an inquiry um, into the Valparite uh, scandal, the fetal Valparite syndrome? That is obviously um, led to that. So th that's my direct question. Do you support an inquiry into it? And are your organisations active in terms of demanding that inquiry uh, from the minister, um, because you'll know from uh, Britain what, what has happened uh, recently. The British Medical Journal has concluded that the evidence there was clear as far back as 1990. Uh, there were risks of uh, congenital malformations in women exposed to valparite. And the risks were beyond all doubt uh, whatsoever from 2005, yet it continued to be prescribed uh, to uh, women in pregnancy. Um, so just in terms of the need for an inquiry uh, into that and how soon that can happen. And just in terms of the medication, like say the medication for, um, um, that's needed, the Spinraza, do you know when a decision is going to be made uh, on, on Spinraza as well? Because obviously that feeds into all of these services um, in terms of new drugs being made available. Um, that it cuts down in terms of the, the, the amount of care and the cost of care uh, um, around um, the neurodegenerative disorders. 
that are caused by these. So, just Thank those. you. Um, Ms Rogers. Okay, just uh, the first query in relation to the, the number of consultant neurolog neurologists and that that's well below um, less than half of where we should be. Um, we would certainly um, highlight the need and, and constantly highlight the need. We, we saw ourselves in the Neurological Alliance, we carried out an audit of, of neurology services um, a number of years ago with the Neurology Clinical Programme, but the results of it still stand and, and have worsened, if anything. Um, we carried out our, our audit in 2015 and we found at that stage that none of the 11 neurology centres around the country had a full multidisciplinary team, even the National Neuroscience Centres in Cork and Dublin. Um, so it would be, we, 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 would, we would say that the, it, the problem, it's, it's a bit of a patchwork solution putting, it, depending on the neurology service to continue to see more and more people without putting the personnel in place that, that need to be there. So we would absolutely say that an increase in the number of neurologists is critically needed. The, these conditions are going to grow as the Irish population ages. Um, we're not going to see a decline in the number of people with neurological conditions, we're going to see an increase. So in order to do all the things that we all know need to be done in terms of early diagnosis, early intervention, we're going to need the people on the ground, not just neurologists, but also the members of the multidisciplinary team. Um, in ones. relation to the... But the rehab, maybe just the, the rehab hospital in terms of the not increasing the capacity, maybe you could just comment on that. I, I think the, the recommendations of the neurorehabilitation strategy in terms of development of neurorehabilitation centres around the country, so whether all of the rehabilitation facilities would need to be sited on the one site going forward, I think that needs to be factored into the decision. Um, I think there's no doubt in the, in the neurorehabilitation strategy that there should be, addition, that there are, are additional beds needed, but I think the, the rollout of the, the national trauma plan will influence where those, those beds get to be. But it's certainly a question whether um, the, all, of, all of the beds need to be on the same site, but there is no doubt that the National Rehabilitation Hospital does need additional capacity. They missed an opportunity, I think, there. And just on the Valparite? Just say one thing about that, that they, it is the development of the NRH site is a phase development plan. So phase one is the replacement beds. Phase two would see additional therapy spaces moving over, and phase three um, would be for additional capacity there. That could be additional beds, yeah. That's the proposal. Yeah. When, is, when will phase three come on board? I can't answer no. that. I'm, yeah. At, at the moment, it's, it's, it's in the pipeline. It's been advanced. Well, can we, before that, just in relation to Deputy Conway Walsh, I would just like to reiterate what Mags was saying in relation to the multidisciplinary team. I mean, the reality is, yes, a person needs a diagnosis, and early, uh, early diagnosis is vital. However, again, reiterating, the person goes back into the community, and in the community, they need that multidisciplinary team approach, and that is everything from the OT to the physiotherapist to the speech and language to um, the neuropsychologist. So I agree with you. When I started working in the sector, neurologists were like hens deep and now we have 34 which is great but it's it is ridiculous like it's somebody is waiting a year to see um, to get a diagnosis you know in a year a lot can happen for somebody in a year in relation to their under, underlying condition I am going to just uh, reference in the access to medicines issue I'm not going to speak specifically on Spinrata but I would like to reference access to medicine so we believe people should have access to the right treatment at the right time there is a whole uh, body of evidence that's now showing internationally that people should be diagnosed early um, and treated appropriately. What we have now in Ireland is an issue with access to new medications. So yes, 20 years ago, if you were diagnosed with MS, you would have been sent home and said, listen, you need to go home, you need to rest, and I have nothing to give you. Thankfully now, the neurologists do have a suite of, serv a suite of uh, disease modifying therapies, so they have 15 or 16 disease modifying therapies to give, but there are new medications coming on stream all the time. The difficulty we have now is that people can't access them because they're not getting through the current system. So I'd reiterate what Mag said earlier about the Medical Research Charities Group and the Irish Platform for Patients of Science and Industry stressing that we need to look at how that system is currently not working and how people do get access because it is about keeping people well. The more we keep people well and participating um, and contributing to society, you know, the better it is for everybody. Um, so I suppose that's, I'd just like to comment on, on those pieces. On um, Valparate and Spinraza before we move on to uh, Professor uh, Senator Burke. <laughs> Thanks for the promotion. <laughs> 
So I'm not, not trying to answer that question, but from an, an organisation who works with people with multiple sclerosis, obviously we wouldn't, we wouldn't comment on, you know, um, um, Epilepsy Ireland are in the room, we wouldn't comment on the inquiry that's currently going in relation to, to FAPERT. So that's okay. the problem, there isn't an inquiry. So yes, I suppose, I, and, and all of the, the, the agencies and all of the organisations that are represented here, I do think there's a role in terms of keeping the pressure on because obviously real injustice was done here in terms of Valbright. It's been proven in France. There's cases going through at the moment in France that are, are likely to be settled in a number of weeks. British medical journals, so it's not unique to Ireland. But we need to know, and families need to know, and people who have been affected by it need to know uh, who knew what and when. Yeah, so DFI was supporting, and actually they're one of their strongest advocates is sitting up there in the in the audience, and DFI, they have been um, positioned in DFI, and we've been supporting the work of this advocate to push for exactly that. So yes. Thank you to continue that. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think, you know, in principle, as members of sort of DFI, we would support anything that was in relation to, you know, did people have proper medical advice, were people given the right guidance at the right time, pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy, and I think it's really important to understand that alcohol fits within that family of known teratogens, um, and so in that context, we would be saying that we need very clear um, one very clear message, we need the clinical guidelines established, um, we need an unequivocal message from the top down, uh, right down to GPs in relation to the teratogenic properties of alcohol. It was considered a uh, teratogen since 96, um, it's considered a, you know, a carcinogenic properties, we also know that it's a neurotoxin in terms of what mm -hmm. Helen has presented in terms of the development of brain injury, so in principle for the families impacted, I think it's really important that we have clarity, that we have consensus and that we have openness in terms of, you know, the fact that as a society we know that, we know the numbers impacted and we need recognition of that. Thank you, Senator. And now, Senator Burke. Thanks very much and, and thank you all for your very um, powerful presentations here this morning. Very much appreciated. Um, can I deal with the issue in relation to f uh, fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder and the whole issue about information out there? I was recently speaking to a person who was working frontline in the medical services and they were dealing with a patient who, in fact, uh, in relation to over a three-month time period, uh, diagnosed, um, uh, this is a per patient that was pregnant, diagnosed as having uh, cocaine in her system. Um, so we're not now talking about alcohol, we're talking about a combination of both alcohol and drugs. And just in relation to the breakdown, you know, you were saying about 600 cases a year. Have we any breakdown from hospitals as regards, you know, is it a bigger problem in certain areas? And the question then about are we doing enough in relation to getting information out there um, about uh, consuming alcohol during pregnancy? While, you know, we, we, one of the big issues that we have in Ireland at the moment is that, you know, the whole uh, abuse of alcohol. Um, at any one time, even while we're sitting here now, there's about 2,000 people occupying hospital beds directly related um, to, um, uh, you know, overuse of alcohol. And I'm just wondering, do you feel that we're doing enough in trying to educate people on this whole issue? And is there a need for a more intense campaign? Um, just going back in relation to the individual hospitals, I can remember dealing with the Rotunda Hospital uh, a number of years ago, where at any one time there were at least 10 babies, at least 10 babies at any one day in withdrawal. I'm not saying 10 babies being born every day, but 10 babies under care who were suffering from withdrawal symptoms mm -hmm. after being uh, born. And I'm just wondering, has there been an increase in real terms in that over the last 10 years? And if there has, then it obviously means that our um, information systems out there is not working at a local level and at a national level and what do we need to do in order to highlight the risks associated with consumption of alcohol during pregnancy um, and how can we factor that in in relation to the whole uh, information program there out in relation to healthcare. So I'm just wondering can we do a lot more on that and are we, is there any such program that is actually proved to work in other countries on this whole issue. 
Um, I think I'll take that. Just in relation to, is there any other programmes that have been proven to work? I suppose it's really important to understand that there is, at a global level, an acceptance that prevention on its own um, won't be adequate to address issues in relation to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. You are going to need a long-term strategy in terms of the provision of supports, the provision of services and the provision of diagnostics in terms of families who are impacted by prenatal alcohol exposure. That said, there is a role for prevention um, and there has been you know, a lot of forward steps taken on that because levels of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder within a population are linked to population level consumption. So on the really positive side, we've seen the bringing forward of the Public Health Alcohol Bill. Within the HSC, um, they've had the establishment of a clinical working group on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the appointment of a clinical lead. Those, that group and that specialist um, have very clearly marked out that the area that they will be covering is in relation to prevention and education and those population level sort of messages. That's really, really welcome um, and we're very happy that that's happening as an organisation. Um, also, uh, we have through the Department of Health, the National Drug Strategy has you know, said that there would be the appointment of an additional seven drug liaison midwives that would work particularly with women who have issues with addiction through pregnancy, who have issues with addiction in relation to alcohol and supporting them in terms of moving towards alcohol-free pregnancies. So there's been a lot done in that space. What we haven't reached yet is sort of, you know, in the medical community and in the policy community, um, one clear message. Do you know what I mean? At an international level, the WHO would say there's no amount of alcohol intake during pregnancy can be considered safe. There's no safe trimester to drink alcohol. All forms of alcohol pose a similar risk and binge drinking pose a dose-related risk. So, for example, we should all be concerned that binge drinking has become very much the mm -hmm. signifier of how we're drinking now as a country. Um, population level consumption over a number of years was coming down, but binging continued to be the norm. Um, so all of those things, we would welcome those. Um, but I think it's really important that we don't just see it in the narrow space of just prevention, because um, there will always be women who continue to drink during pregnancy and one of the reasons for those say the EU Birth Moms Association so that would be a group of um, at a European level um, mothers who have children who have been impacted by FASD and they're very clear that there's a very complex uh, mix of reasons why women drink during pregnancy that may be associated with childhood trauma, it may be associated with addiction, it may be associated with knowing people who drank during pregnancy and their children were okay because not every alcohol exposed pregnancy will result in a child who has FASD. Um, so those are sort of very important messages. The other reason that prevention is a huge challenge um, is because um, oftentimes women may not know that they're pregnant until say five, six, seven, eight weeks into a pregnancy. Um, so you've had that period at the beginning of the pregnancy uh, where the fetus may have been exposed to alcohol. So there's a whole range of reasons that we need to approach in a real no stigma, no shame, no blame way and start to sort of understand that this is really complex. We need the prevention, we need a clear message from our medical community, but we're also going to need supports and services. And supports and services will only follow when we have diagnostics. And that's why we would be asking the committee here to use whatever access and influence you have to support that call for the development of clear diagnostic criteria for FAS and FASD, those spectrums of disorders that are associated with alcohol. But isn't there the other complex now of the combination of alcohol and uh, drugs? Yeah. And I mean, you know, and I'm just wondering if, we, if we've got the figures for, say, over the last 15 years, how that has changed as regards um, fetal alcohol uh, syndrome. Like, ha has there been a huge increase? What kind of percentage increase have we seen over the last 15 years? Um, the bottom line is we don't, we don't know in terms of an evidence base. The um, figures that I've given you this morning, and I've said that in the submission, are related to um, sort of figures that have been extrapolated from international studies where they have population level data, when they, where they know what that is. So they've looked at sort of... Um, drinking rates in Ireland, they've looked at numbers of women who've reported self-reported drinking during pregnancy and they've extrapolated those figures. So it's likely that the figures in Ireland are higher, but we know, say, across addiction services that people who are presenting with addictions to more than one issue, so alcohol plus other drugs, we do know that that's an increasing factor in Ireland and something that needs to be addressed in a policy and in a service space. Okay. Thank right. you.
Thank you, uh, Senator Burke. And now, uh, Senator John Dolan. Good morning, Ms. Um I'm delighted um, to have the six witnesses that we have in front of us t today. And I think their evidence is quite challenging to us in a number of ways. And I look forward to uh, reading back the transcripts. And I think we need to maybe look again. There's so much going on here today that I can identify that um, and that we can't get into in this session. Prevention, different mix of services, who might be providing what, impacts on people's lives, etc., etc. But leave, it, leave, leave that at that. I want to start with um, um, Joanne McCarthy on page two of her uh, presentation. She set out that, that uh, the 1.9 billion in the disability services programme that 85% of it goes on residential day services and respite. And those types of services go back, in my view, to old God's time, when we didn't have diagnostics and we put, uh, tried to put people in caring places and we hadn't much else going on. It's a real question for us all, and I'd be interested in, in, in some short comments. Have we got the ratios very, very wrong in terms of the funding for the disability services program in the round, if 85% of it is going to, to services and supports, and I'm not suggesting in many ways that they're not needed, but there's only 15% going on, on supports that are in the community. The point was made that so many people were <coughs> in the community and go back into the community and stay in the community or try to survive in it. Uh, they, they, so I think, and that's particularly for uh, uh, when, when you take the court, we're looking at today people with um, neurological conditions. So the other point I want to, um, question I want to ask generally is could or how might launch a care be part of the solution, solutions that you were talking to? Is it naive? Is it missing a trick in this area? Or has it potential? Um, the, the, um, in relation to the presentation by Mags Rogers uh, in relation to neurological lines, the uh, issue of, well, let me give my view, a national policy and strategy for neurological services that is published in 2011 and an implementation plan for it that's published a couple of weeks ago, February 2019. Um, the nice way I put this is, what has been the loss of progress in those eight years by not having an implementation plan? Oh, uh, okay, an implementation plan is never going to say, there's billions of money for you, sort everything out. But, that's the nice way of putting it, and my own view of this is that I think it's incredible and it's wrong, and I think it's something that we should note here. When we get strategies about whatever without an implementation plan that turns up on the desk in a timely fashion in the same year, I think it's actually saying to us that maybe what people were given was a bit of pain relief and a kind of a, 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 a three-card trick. We have a strategy, we have a policy, but we've no implementation of it. Um, the Eva and they, they mentioned the impact of medicines in the supplementary question the, or response there a few minutes ago. You, I think what you said was if you go back over the last 20 or so years, there wasn't a lot in terms of medicine to give to people. And I know from meeting people with MS going back to the early 80s, it was pretty grim. It was grim and the impact, awful impact it had on families, and the same with other uh, neurological conditions. So I'm, I'm asking what, in very round terms, what's the potential, what's the impact, how, or how has uh, the development of these medicines that can modify stuff had on people's daily lives? And what can it further have if, if we have what, um, what, um, what's needed? Um, the, the presentations in relation to, to um, the two alcohol-related um, <coughs> issues, um, firstly, the, firstly the, 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 uh, 
alcohol-related brain injury and then the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And sec uh, in relation to both of those, um, or sorry, the first point that uh, early on in that when Helen was speaking, alcohol-related brain injury, poor, very poor identification of, um, of the condition. And then the, the letter Kenny Sligo Cavan um, information. Um, we hear a lot about waste in the health services, mm -hmm. that there's still waste. I'm not so sure that when we hear people talk about the waste in the health services, they're actually talking about the effects of misdiagnosis. Um, so I'd be just interested in that we, we think about stuff being thrown away and not being used properly or this, that and the other. Um, and um, the to the recommendations that come from both of these presentations, including Paul, Paula's one, um, I think they're very interesting because they're not asking for a big wad of money. They're actually asking, can we please find out what in the name of hell is going on for thousands and thousands of people and families in this country for a condition that has a huge pile of knock-ons. And I can't remember the detail you gave about, you mentioned a whole range of other comorbidities and, and conditions. And um, so I suppose that's as much a plea to um, our, ourselves, the committee, to do what we can to, uh, to move on those. A lot more that I'd like to say, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll accede to your request, Cahira, and leave it at that. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, Joanne? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Um, I suppose, and I'm always really conscious when we put these figures up, that it looks like you're splitting the sector into those that have and those have not, and that's not the intent of what those are. I suppose it's just I needed people to see the starkness of the inequities of access to disability services in Ireland. Um, so do we have the wrong types of models of support? Um, without a doubt, our policy, or the, the review of the, our policy review would have said that around the value for money. Um, if you look at what's expected of us under the UNC or PD now, of course we have the right amount, the wrong mix of services. Um, people with disabilities and their families should be confident that they can receive services as close to their local community. And this, this resonates with what we're talking about here, you know, with access to new rehabilitation services. So as close to our local communities and as individually as, as individual as possible. Um, I suppose it is no surprise that um, there has been a no real increase in PA services, respite, um, those sorts of services that facilitate a person to live in the community. Um, there is also an issue to do with um, how do you, um, the lack of demographic evidence to support how you would transition towards a new model of service. Um, we know, and that's what they are trying to do around decongregation and around supporting new models of day services, because they have the evidence, they know the data, they know who they're talking about and they can plan that. It's very hard to talk about a new model of service around community services infrastructure when you don't actually have the evidence, the demographic ed evidence to show what the need will be time and time again to support the planning process um, and to give confidence to the planners and to those who will deliver service but also for those that will depend on it that it, that, that what will be there. Um, so you are right if you were to redefine or re or re if you were to rewrite a service model for people with disabilities, it's not fit for purpose. People do need to live at home or need to live independently or as close um, to the communities as possible. Um, they need to be person-centred. They need a mix and a range of uh, personally driven services such as PA and home supports and the interventions that we've talked about now, the episodic health interventions that are required. And it also needs to go out beyond health. Health is only the enabler. So the health services should be there to enable people to access services in other, from other departments and agencies. So education should be delivered through, um, through ETBs and supported to be delivered in a mainstream way as much as possible through ETBs. Um, your social welfare services, your housing services, these are all mainstream services. And I, so, but we need a health service that has um, resources and supports such as PA hours that are fit for purpose to support people to be able to access mainstream services. So we need to think, we need to reinvert our understanding of the role of the health and look more at the personal social services side of those health services and invest in them. So that will be my answer. Thank you. Um, 
uh, Senator also asked about um, uh, the, the ratio. Have, have we got the ratio wrong in relation to most money going to residential and only a small proportion going that to residential? That was all my answer. Okay. 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 That. The yeah. slant of care was another one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, probably, I can probably just say Slauncher Care and then I can step back, but in terms of Slauncher Care, Slauncher Care is very silent on disability actually, in, um, it does talk about the new rehabilitation strategy, but actually very, very silent on, on disability. I think there, I don't even know, I think there might be one reference, um, maybe two. Um, so basically the type of things that we are looking for is, it's that interface. So if you look at health, people with disabilities are heavy users of the health system, okay? So they are the neurological people who present. Um, and are taking up acute services, they, they acquire brain injury, they are those people that are in relapse, okay, so they are heavy users of the core health systems, but they are also the people that are also using the rehabilitation services through primary care, and they're also the ones that are accessing PA and home supports, so they, 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 try, they have a draw across the health system, but they are dealt with individually through each siloed part of the HSE. Slaunter Care says that it looks for joined up services and I suppose we'd want that look, we'd want to have um, almost like that um, disability proofed in terms of how do you, how do you enable those different m models of service to talk so that if I'm a person with acquired and um, Ava could probably give an example of this better, so that, um, so on an ongoing, the majority of the services could be delivered in a much softer community-based infrastructure, such as the type of resources and supports for self-management that are provided at community level. There will be times where there'll be a peak in the condition and access to primary cares will be required then, and there'll be times, especially around diagnosis, where the more acute services will have to pay an intervention. But equally, the step downs and the, the fluidity between the step downs is critical at that point. So, I suppose Sloan, the, the silence of Slauncher Care and understanding sometimes who its population predominantly is and how they use the use of how they use the health services, the need for that to stitch is probably something we need to work on. And something we were sorry, no, no. something we're particularly interested in in terms of the the neuro rehabilitation demonstrator project that I, that I outlined in my statement. Um, the neurological lines are particularly supportive of that because we see that as joining those various parts, that the acute service providers are there, the acute hospitals, the, the existing rehabilitation units, all the way through to primary, um, primary care voluntary providers, that they're all involved in one network. And, this, and it's, a, it's a practical project that's doing Slauncher Care on the ground. It, it's, it's fulfilling Slaunch, Slaunch Care's ethos on the ground and that's something, that's something we were looking for and as I say, it's, it's happening and that's why we're calling for, for funding for that project because it is fulfilling that, it is the magic formula for that integration across hospital, community and people living long term with the condition. Mm. Uh, Senator John, I'd like to address two of your points. You asked what has been the loss of progress in the past eight years? because you asked about the fact that we have reports and now we're only coming up with an impl implementation plan. For me, the loss has actually been an increase in disability mm. for people um, because they haven't had access to services. It has been a decrease in people's quality of life. It has resulted in young people living in nursing homes because if you go back to what uh, my colleague has said about silos in the HSE not having conversations with each other, so one budget won't give somebody a home care package, but will put a 42-year-old man with three children in a nursing home to provide him with care for the rest of his life. So it's that, it's that seamless service about putting the person at the centre, which is going back to your point about Slaunter Care and what it says, putting the person at the centre of our service delivery and developing our service around the person and what the person needs to stay well and in the community. So the loss of progress has been huge for um, uh, for us, for everybody, for people. Um, then I suppose you asked about the impact of medicines. I suppose often what we find is when you talk about medicines, the only medicines that get on um, the radio are the ones that are going to improve or give me um, another few days or another few weeks in my life. There's very few discussions about uh, medicines and how they improve a person's quality of life. Um, but if you ask people with MS, um, I can only speak about that specifically. If you ask people with MS, the, the fact that there are new medicines brings huge hope. And that's what people need, is, is access to medicines that keep them well. So if I was to say to all of you guys today that you weren't going to make it to the bathroom, 
you know, we'd all be very embarrassed about that. But we take all that for granted because we're just going to get up and walk out and we're going to go to the bathroom, whatever. Whereas for some people, when they take a new medication and it makes a difference for them that they can make it to the bathroom, that means that they can, they're not afraid of staying in their house anymore. They can go out and socialise. That means they go to work. And it goes back to the points we've made earlier. They contribute to society and they have a better quality of life. So access to medicines, access to all treatments. So I would broaden it to access to treatments across the board for people is vitally important. And I do believe the Staunch Care does. It looks at that from the point of view of you know, keeping people well, that self-management piece in the community. But again, we need to put resources behind that. There's no point just doing a lovely report and then leaving it on the shelf, because then it's not going to benefit anybody. Thank you very much. And Paula Leonard. Thanks a million. Um, just, I suppose, I'm coming at it from a slightly different angle in relation to Senator Dolan's observations. I suppose the first thing is to acknowledge, yes, I suppose, um, in, both in relation to alcohol-related brain injury and in relation to FASD, um, what we can demonstrate in terms of the evidence is that by putting in place early intervention and supports for families impacted by both conditions, there could be huge potential cost savings to the state. Um, for example, I'm just going to quote in relation to Canada. Canada is actually considered to be one of the global leaders in relation to prevention, treatment and support around fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. But the Canadian federal government has estimated it cost taxpayers an equivalent of 1.2 million euros, which is 1.75 Canadian dollars, extra for every person that's born prenatally alcohol exposed, but that huge cost savings can be made through early intervention diagnosis and support across the lifespan. But just in relation to that, I suppose you, you mentioned waste in the health system. Waste in relation to fetal alcohol spectrum disorder spans across a whole range of systems. So it's the education system in terms of dropout and then trying to address that. It's the justice system in terms of the cost of somebody being incarcerated in jail because they simply didn't have the right supports or advocacy within the system. It's in the terms of social supports and it's in terms of health, not diagnosing, not understanding the conditions and the comorbidities. So I think that you're absolutely right. I suppose our asks are very much around our approach, our understanding and our acceptance that these are significant mm -hmm. public health issues in this country. The other thing I want to be really clear of is our ask in relation to the development of diagnostics. Um, our policy position on that is informed by families who are impacted by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Two years ago we supported families to come together to form the END PAE Alliance, which is to end PAE, which is the neurological developmental disorder prenatally alcohol exposed. And when I asked those families in terms of today's opportunity what the one ask would be, they all clearly are looking for clear diagnostic guidelines. So they're saying nothing can happen until we at least understand what is happening with children and then we can become the advocates in terms of schools, in terms of those difficult transitional places and all of those. There will be a budget, but it will be a, a, you know, a spend to save approach if we do it properly as a, as a country. Thank you very much, Ms Leonard. And now we're going to go to Deputy Durkin and then Deputy O'Connell. <coughs> Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <coughs> My apologies for late arrival. I had another engagement and, and uh, I, I only got the tail end of the presentations. But I'm familiar with the, with the subject matter under discussion. And just a couple of observations. Uh, in terms of a public information programme uh, in relation to all the issues that you have dealt with and that, that you have faced up to and that you have reported on, uh, how can we improve that? What's, what, what, what's really, uh, we, we, we hear about Fabry's conditions and how, the, uh, you know, maybe in some cases the condition has progressed to the extent that it's not possible to deal with it in the, way that, the best possible way. Uh, I believe that there's a space for a really serious public information programme which makes the general public aware uh, and based on facts as opposed to scaring the public. Um, how do you see that being put into operation in a, in a, in a, in a better way? <coughs> Will I give you all the questions together? Please. Yeah. The other one can I ask as well in relation to uh, the whole question of uh, diagnostics and neurological uh, uh, conditions. Um, uh, Staunch Care, in fact, does address the diagnostics bits to, it's, it's automatically part of, of, of the programme. 
And I just wonder if you are satisfied that the diagnostics in, incorporated in Staunchia Care are, are adequate uh, by, 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 by virtue of your own uh, experience. The third question is in relation to new conditions, new neurologic conditions like guillain barre or, or other similar conditions that appear to have been uh, difficult to diagnose uh, up to very recently. And uh, having dealt with a number of cases, I'm sure everybody else has dealt with cases, similar cases as well, where rare conditions, one in 200,000, one in 500,000 or whatever, seem to come up more regularly than, than, than was anticipated. And as a result, uh, diagno diagno diagnosis was slow uh, to the detriment of, 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 of the patient. And in, in some of these cases, uh, the diagnosis was, 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 was uh, uh, um, you know, delay of two months, six months, whatever the case may be, in a very sensitive situation where the patient, obviously, and the patient's family have, have, have been um, suffering considerable stress. So those are the three questions, if, if you might, uh, if you might uh, uh, address them, please. Public information campaign in relation to the, the alcohol issue? or yes, and yeah. and other issues as well. There are other issues that, that information is important, how to deal with situations that arise uh, in, in, in the public arena, as it were. Quickly, in terms of public information campaigns, I think there is huge progress being made in relation to the alcohol piece. We have the Ask About Alcohol campaign, so there's radio, TV um, and web content, um, and that's the only sort of WHO accepted website in Ireland mm -hmm. in relation to public information around alcohol. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Um, we have, you know, the um, working group within the HSE that's limited to the HSE at the moment in terms of any other forward movements, we would be in consensus with the WHO guidelines that would say that you need to have involvement of people and their families impacted by the condition in terms of moving forward around how you do that and do that sensitively. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge what has been done really well. Um, and I think the other big challenge around fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is within the medical community, OBS and Gynae, and in GPs, we have suffered very badly in this country over numbers of years because there was somewhat you know, equivocal messages coming through. We are moving much closer to an unequivocal message. Um, my understanding is the HSC is collaborating with you know, numbers of people around that in relation to um, a position paper at the moment, and I would hope that we would have something over the next number of months so that the medical community is completely singing from the one hymn sheet around that. So I think on that, you know, we would welcome what's happening, um, and I think there's nothing sort of additionality that we'd be looking for. So. Glad to say that piece. I don't know in relation to other conditions. Yeah, I think each of us, each, sorry, uh, Deputy Durkin, I think each of us as individual neurological organisations try to create awareness about our own conditions. So, for example, recently we had an um, MS understood coffee shop where people came in, they didn't know what they were coming into other than coffee shop, and they got to experience some of the symptoms of what it's like to live with multiple sclerosis. So the minute you went inside the door, the ground was uneasy under your feet. When you went to order your latte or your cafe or whatever it was, um, the, it start, the, the board started to blur and that you were experiencing blurred vision. So the, because people with MS have expressed to us when they're diagnosed, they don't know what it is themselves often, and certainly their family don't know what it is themselves, and their family perceive it to be, you know, an older person's condition and you're going to end up in a wheelchair. So there is huge need for awareness, especially if you mentioned as well about the GPs. So we would often um, now have people with MS who go into the colleges and go to the medical students who are actually uh, training to be our next doctors and, and nurses and actually talk to them about what it's like to experience the conditions so that people are actually having a better sense of that. So there's a lot of that more public patient involvement going on, which is obviously very important. But then we would work with the likes of, because there is unity in working together as well, we would work with the likes of the Disability Federation of Ireland and the Neurological Alliance of Ireland and their campaigns that they would run around trying to create an awareness amongst the general population around neurological conditions in general. Because a lot of people just, you know, unless something comes to your door, you probably don't have a sense of it. And you mentioned the rare diseases, for example. You know, people have no idea what a lot of those conditions are. So it's around trying to work with the DFI and the NAI around creating that awareness amongst our general population as well. And I 
a very, it's an extremely under-resourced area in terms of promoting awareness, in terms of national awareness campaigns for neurological conditions. And I suppose it, it's, it's maybe in an under-recognised strength of of individual charities like MS Ireland and, and other neurological charities that they take on this bash. Um, they do this piece, they fundraise for this, they do this as part of and, and no one else is doing it. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a huge respons responsibility to land on not-for-profit organisations that they also take on this um, education and awareness piece as well. Can I just say, just, uh, just about to try to come in on that, just to say that um, it's becoming harder and harder to get funding to do this sort of work. So um, I would have spoke earlier on about the 85% of the HSE funding that's going into disability services. That other 15%, 10% of that, a lot, a lot of that is around that information. Um, advocacy work that's going on to try to raise awareness around, the, around particular conditions and the similarities that happened across conditions. However, um, increasingly the HSE, um, who are these funders, will say that's not our business. We're not, you know, that we, we, we don't fund that. We fund core disability services stuff. So I think we really, like, and then we also have a part of the HSE that does um, help promotion, but doesn't actually see disability as part of its responsibility because disability is done through disabilities or, or neurological. So I suppose valuing um, the knowledge base that was in all of these organisations, their link with Europe, um, the information services that they provide um, to families that are in crisis at any particular period of time, and having that embedded in a, in a real funding stream can make a massive difference to the, to the lives of individuals and families in the community. And I think it's, um, so thank you, um, Deputy Director, for raising, because it's such um, an unappreciated value of the role of the organisations that are um, currently provided, and nobody wants to actually fund that, and it's something that we do have to look into. Thank you very much. Now, Deputy <coughs> O'Connell, thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, and sorry, um, I was late as well at another engagement this morning. Um, just briefly touching on the Valproate issue, um, and I'm a pharmacist by profession, so I've been um, um, dispensing Valproate for years, um, and we talk about um, awareness of the side effects and when it happened and that. In terms of where we go from here, um, women that have epilepsy, that want to have a baby, have an additional requirement for folic acid. So it's all fine complaining about the past, and I understand um, as a pharmacist people's issues, but surely the focus should be on proper folic acid supplementation to, pro to mitigate against um, any of the side effects of medications that people often have to take to keep them seizure free to maintain their pregnancy. So it's, folic acid is something I feel particularly strongly about, not just in neurological conditions, but because we're, we're discussing it here today, there is an additional need for higher strength folic acid, depending on the weight, but my understanding the amount of practice now is five megs, 20 times mm. the dose. So that, that's, that, that, that is not known out there. And there is, that, to my mind, that message has to be delivered through the GP and through the community pharmacist. Because in terms of access, generally, it's the community pharmacist who knows somebody is pregnant first because we sell the pregnancy test. Mm. And I have worked with my own party and I'm doing a bit of work on it where folic acid um, is sitting beside pregnancy tests. The folic acid is free, the folic acid, I've done the sums on it, how much it would cost, I've looked at other countries, that you know, we can, we can, we can, some things we can't change now, but we can protect population health to the future with po proper folic acid supplementation. So perhaps any work anybody's doing in that regard, if you could speak yeah, to it. Just the, the, oh, sorry. I'll fire them all out because I know these people are waiting all morning. Um, in terms of um, access to meds, and I can't remember which of you spoke to, um, to it, and I do agree with you that if the focus of the system is qualies and how many years you're going to live, you take X, Y and Z tablet. But in terms of our CAMBI, and just want to put it on the record here today, the, 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 it was discussed, it was well discussed when our CAMBI was being approved, um, that it wasn't just about curing a condition or living longer, it was about um, the increase in lung function, what that could mean for somebody. So I do think um, that discussion has started and it's not as clinical and cold as it used to be. Um, obviously there's a way to go there, but just, just to make sure that um, the message is going out that our CAMBI did not go through the system and did not tick the boxes, but a dispensation was made to my mind because of the high, high rate in Ireland, um, and the, the particularly high rate in Ireland, but also that we had advocates out there that put their names forward, that showed that 
their quality of life. Um, what, what this small in, in terms of lung function increase gave them in terms of their quality of life. Um, in terms, another, um, in the case of the rapid um, neurological disorders such as motor neuron disease and some of the rapid cycling MSs, um, it's an issue, and, and perhaps you discussed it before I came in. But the home care packages kick in at 65. And if somebody of a motor neuron often is a, a younger person's condition, mid 40s, um, that when you're faced, and it, it, regardless of your means, you require a medical card when you have a, it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, you require a medical card when you get a condition like this because you need access to the services. I know you all know this, but, um, um, but it, it, I find it very concerning that a family or an individual, and some people don't have any family, are faced with this burden of a condition, a very frightening condition, along with a bundle of paperwork, along with you cannot access because you're not 65, though you have a, a condition that some people associate with older people. And have you done any work, or any of your organisations done any work um, to present to the Minister for Health as to how we can just make it easier for people in their most desperate time to access services um, and to access home care packages and to access um, the grants that are required for the conversion of their homes as their condition progresses. Because many people want to live in their own homes if they have a, a rapid uh, progressing condition. And I often deal with people, sadly, um, that have died before they get the um, the, um, the suitable bits put into their homes. Um, so if, if, if you're doing any work on that and if there's anything you've put to the Minister, I'd, I'd like to hear about it because I think it's something that could be easily fixed. No doctor is going to sign off and say that somebody has a rapid neurological disorder unless they do have it. So I can't see how GPs can certify why so much of a rigmarole has to be gone through where there's a definitive diagnosis of a serious um, um, neurological disorder. And just finally, um, <clears throat> I sit on the Public Accounts Committee and we had the EPA in recently about water quality and I spoke to an, um, a, a National Geographic um, report on the high level of um, drugs, both illicit and otherwise, in the water supplies in some cities. And last week, um, it was reported that the shrimp in Suffolk, I don't know if anybody has read about the shrimp in Suffolk, all of them um, tested positive for cocaine. So in terms of when we have, um, it's, it's becoming a huge issue by the looks of things that we have um, <coughs> excretion of illicit substances into our water supply. So we talk here about people taking alcohol consciously in pregnancy, taking drugs consciously in pregnancy. But have you any, any work or studies that show that um, perhaps increases on, in neurological disorders or neurological conditions in neonates. Um, is there any link to water quality or is there any of your organisations undertaking a body of work? The EPA, I'm still waiting um, a reply from them from three weeks ago on what work they're doing. But in terms of um, the very, very clear carcinogenic, um, teratogenic and um, neurotoxic effects of um, illicit substances. Surely it is perhaps somebody within, within your field is doing work on this, or maybe it's only myself thinking about these things. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, who would like to take some of those questions? Just in relation to your comment on, on folic acid, and it goes back to Deputy Durkin's comment about the our own comment to him about the, the voluntary organisation taking up the mantle on this. I'm aware that one of our members, Spina Bifta and Hydrocephalus Association of Ireland, um, has been doing work in terms of promoting use of, of folic acid for obvious reasons with, the, with their organisation. Um, so that is one organisation that, that's yeah. stepping up there um, in terms of a preventative approach. But in terms of, of, of women suffering from epilepsy, it just seems so logical that there would be a a very obvious campaign through GPs and pharmacies. It's not known. It's, it's, it's not something that you hear discussed. Maybe Dr. Hart, you have a different view, but it's not something people are aware of. I understand. I'm just going to answer generically on that. It's not known, and you're talking about the need for it, but who's going to pay for it? Like, from, from our point of view as an organisation, we could talk about, with MS, sorry, we could talk about um, vitamin D, for example, mm -hmm. and the importance of people taking vitamin D. 
but again it's around you have a range of services that you're trying to provide you're fundraising to provide those services and then there's an awareness campaign that needs to happen as well so you have the difficulty with well who's going to provide that awareness campaign that you're speaking about mm -hmm. and how do we resource getting the GPs and the pharmacists to actually take on board what we're saying because now you actually have to pay um, an external company to get your leaflet into a GP surgery so I, I'm not disagreeing with what mm -hmm. you're saying I'm just saying how do we manage to do that when we already have to try and provide a service directly to, to people if I can continue yes, on to mm -hmm. some of your other you mentioned about our Canby and being not as clinical and as cold and what I would like to just say on that is I actually agree with you from the point of view of the fact that now in the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics process you actually can make a patient submission we call it a patient submission that's what they so that is very positive and that's very welcomed mm -hmm. by our community to say well actually we're not just down to a quality adjusted life year of 44,000 euro what in the love and honor <laughs> does that actually mean to anybody do you know what I mean so I suppose from our perspective we would say actually having a patient um, uh, the fact that we can make a representation on behalf of people who are the people who are going to be using those drugs is very very positive and you also if I can um, go back to your point about the medical card yeah it's ridiculous like it's absolutely ridiculous that somebody who has been diagnosed with the condition who already has to get their head around actually being diagnosed with anything it doesn't matter what condition it has sometimes has to fight for their medication mm -hmm. has to fight for um, access to whatever it is that would make their life better and it is absolutely ridiculous so I can't say anything to other than that that it is ridiculous and it shouldn't be that way people should have access to whatever it is they need and I suppose while we're giving out I mean would it be your view that it's causing unnecessary pain at a more it is. Yeah. 100%. I'd have a query around when the problems arise as well because I think whatever about signing off someone saying yes they need a home care package it's then getting that like yes, then it's, it's a question of that funding comes up. and yeah you, you yeah. get it you get assigned a home care package and you think that's Yes. And, and it doesn't, especially say it doesn't matter as much, but when, when you have a rapid condition, it mm -hmm. really matters. Yes. Yeah. So you never yeah. actually get to, to spend your home care package, you're yeah. gone sometimes. And I think with the point that you made about any medical practitioner would be very willing to sign up that pers this person needs a home care package, but there's a chasm between then and actually delivering it. It, it's, it's, it really is beyond me how a, a neurologist and who will have to diagnose it and the GP can't tick the box on this one. Can I just say, and just to say that oftentimes that we do know that a lot of the organisations, especially the neurological ones, pick up the slack. So we know the neuro, um, I'm just thinking, um, I remember when I first joined the sector, if you want to put this a long, long time ago, and getting briefed by motor neurons mm -hmm. and the types of services that they do. So they provide, they know that in any one year they have about 400 people diagnosed in different stages of the condition. And they basically provide, um, you know, family support after it for bereavement, they provide aids and appliances, they provide, so they're stepping into exactly the space you're talking about. So we know there is a model that's there. And um, we, are, and I don't know, Deputy, if you were there for our own, so apologies, but we had talked about the need for establishing a community services program. That's exactly it. It's to, at the point of diagnosis or at the point of presentation, that they, that you're able to to respond to the immediate needs as close to that person's home or in that person's home as possible and to have that and then that you're bringing in as if, exactly as what you've done your GP your physios your primary care and that you're actually coordinating in a, in a sustained way and um, all the actors that will help that person to live as long as possible with good quality of life and also that you're activating the other like housing adaptation mm -hmm. all they were able to negotiate that new world because post diagnosis it's it's uh, you know, you can only, I can only imagine um, the sense of bewilderment and, and trying to, as an individual or a family, deal with the diagnosis and, all, and at the same time advocate, pull down resources. So it is a need for it. But to be fair, that's what the community and voluntary sector do best. It's if you take mm -hmm. um, the Epilepsy Ireland, the MS Ireland, they, they work with the person in the community and you, you talked about yeah. the grant application where most people look at it and go, I have no idea how to fill in. Whereas They'll the community worker has filled out 50 of them mm -hmm. and knows exactly what you have to write in to make sure that you get the application. So they, they are the people in the community working with people who have been diagnosed, whether it's from the psychological point of view, whether it's the, the, the you need um, actually counselling versus the actual physiotherapy that you need. They're the people who are coordinating, they're signposting to the HSE, they're engaging with the various different organisations. But it's 
but like your again, and this is um, no no different than else, but depending on where you live, geography will determine your access. So you can have four or five very good local um, organisations working locally, and your access to your resources will be very different. You'll experience that condition very different than someone who's diagnosed maybe up in Donegal and has no access to resources. So when we talk about developing community services programme, it's so that there is a understanding um, that there's a shared plan around what you're entitled to once. Once, you, once, you, once you're in the community, once you've been diagnosed with a condition or a disability, what are the, what's the basket of services that are there that you can then, that you're entitled to and resource? And that, that, should, that shouldn't matter whether you're talking about CHO1 or CHO9. It should the same access. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask uh, Francis Black and Thomas Bringle. Perhaps you, you might ask your questions together, together. in the interest of time. Absolutely. So thank you very and much. And I'll try and be as short as I can. Is that all right, Thomas? Yeah. I'll, I'll be quick. So, uh, yeah, I mean, firstly, just, I just want to say thank you all for the great, fantastic work that you're doing. Um, you really are out there, uh, you know, on the ground, doing phenomenal stuff. I suppose I'd be very uh, uh, interested, I suppose, in the alcohol piece. Um, and I know, um, I know, Helen, that you mentioned, like, you know, around the stigma, and you, you spoke a little bit about this, but for me it's, it's an area that I'm extremely interested in, and mm. there seems to be a huge moral model um, and, and stigma around alcohol-related brain mm. injuries and fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder. And, you know, at one, at one point here you say, you know, that uh, people are passed between pillar and post and falling between two... There seems to be a lack of compassion and empathy Absolutely. around this mm -hmm. area so I'm just wondering from your perspective just uh, how you think we can go forward mm -hmm. um, on on this issue on both you know on both the um, the, the fetal um, the, the fetal spectrum disorder the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and the alcohol related brain, brain injury and also just there was a report then I, I don't know who would like to answer this there was a report um, the World Health Organization report on your neuro neurological disorders uh, public health challenges. It was a very extensive report describing and discussing the increasing global public health importance of common neurological disorders such as dementia, epilepsy. Um, he dedicates a whole section um, uh, to the uh, uh, neurological um, disorders associated with mal malnutrition and the ingestion of toxic compounds. And I just want to give a quick quote. Priori priorities need to be identified for the actions needed to deal with neurological disorders associated with malnutrition or ingestion of toxic compounds such as alcohol. So my question is for you is what, what efforts um, that you're aware of are currently being taken in, in the Irish neurology services to address these two these two neuro neurological conditions, particularly around alcohol related brain, brain injury and alcohol fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So I'm sorry, I know I was I have so many other questions, I'm just trying to rush that as quick as I could. Thank you, uh, Senator Black and Deputy Pringle. Yeah, Chairman, uh, thanks for let, letting me in there. And um, again, I'm going to be very parochial and just ask the questions of the Donegal uh, team because um, <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's, it's so, so long. But it's actually, it's actually um, inter interesting that the, the Donegal team are actually a national team and uh, based in Letterkenny, which is a very good model, I must say, and it's a model that could be actually looked at. Um, not everything has to be based in Dublin for it to actually happen uh, in the country here, and that's very important. But I suppose really, I mean, I think the presentation outlines everything as, as vitally, as very worthwhile presentation. And um, Paula said it like when we shouldn't talk about stig no stigma, no shame and no blame in dealing with the issues here, which is vitally important as well. And from a purely, which I think the HSE and probably the Department of Health will understand, it saves money. And that's the reality of the situation, and especially from sitting on the local health forums every week, every couple of months, and we're talking about delayed discharges and about trying to get people out of hospital and getting them into this would actually save that money and free up those beds, and that's vitally important. So the only thing I really would ask, is probably for yourself, Chairman, I would ask maybe if the committee could write to the HSE and to the Department of Health outlining the two asks that the Alcohol Forum have there uh, in relation to the establishment of a multidisciplinary cross directed national working group on alcohol and also then the, the clinic propose the, the clinical guidelines for diagnosing that. If the committee would actually write to those specifically to the HSE and the Department of Health, I think that would be vitally important and follow up, start that conversation with them. Thanks. Thank you very much. And just before we conclude, 
Could I ask a question in relation to the number of neurologists and the deficiency in, the, in that number? Uh, is there any progress being made in the uh, development of community clinical nurse specialists in relation to Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, all the other uh, neurological conditions that require community services, that if you can't get to see your neurologist or there isn't yeah. a sufficient complement of neurologists, um, surely community uh, um, nurse specialists in, in those disciplines would be of great benefit to people to pr take pressure from the hospital-based services, but also to in increase their um, involvement uh, in delivering services within the community. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The, do you, can I answer that? Okay. Do you want to, are, are you dealing with the... No, well, we can take them in whatever order you like, but as long as you answer them all in the next ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, this one will be short anyway, so I can give, I can give a response to it. Um, we're very pleased that the focus of the neurology clinical programme is now very much on uh, the role of the clinical nurse specialist and increasing that role. We've seen a very positive, through the epilepsy programme, and their concentration on the development of, of the clinical nurse specialist in epilepsy and the learning from that is being transferred to the neurology program and some of the proposals that you heard from, heard about today in terms of increasing clinical nurse specialist role in the management of motor neuron disease and the management of, of multiple sclerosis and that needs to transfer I completely agree that needs to transfer to other conditions but there certainly is that focus at the moment that's really welcomed by the neurological alliance in the neurology clinical program Thank you. No. Uh, Francis had spoken about the fetal alcohol syndrome spectrum. In, you, and in relation to the RBIP strategy. Oh, okay. that yeah, no, so just in relation to the, the stigma, I think the, the stigma around this condition is very, very per pervasive and there is this, um, I suppose, presumption that this is a, a condition that is self-inflicted. Um, that the person has had a hand in really themselves and that they're just they're just alcoholics they're difficult clients but i think that we need to consider as well the fact that you know in ireland among those who drink the majority of people are doing at a harmful level and um, more than 150,000 irish people are dependent drinkers and 1.35 million are um, harmful drinkers so um it's important to note that alcohol dependency it's a very big issue in ireland as well but i think um, just in relation to neurological conditions i think that every life is important regardless of the cause of the person's uh, disability or neurological condition and i think that it needs to be given emphasis um alongside other conditions in, in a consistent way thank you just the, the final question when my, uh, the efforts that are that people are aware of uh, being taken in irish neurology services to address the two neuro neurological issues around uh, alcohol related brain injury and alcohol does anybody has anybody any awareness around that no there there isn't is maybe there's not any is there okay. i think there is um the the efforts of the group that that are here today and there there are also some some isolated initiatives and, and individual clinicians um doing their best and taking a role in, in highlighting it and, and in researching the issue. But I, I, think it, I think it needs to, you know, as our, our colleagues have said today, that it needs to have a greater prioritisation. But just in terms of that entire report, I mean, that, that World Health Organization report um, names neurological conditions as the greatest challenge facing public health systems worldwide. And in Ireland, we're certainly not treating it that way, and we haven't been. And we continue not to not to address the huge needs. Like this is coming down the line, mm -hmm. uh, like a steamroller in terms of our aging population. And we're certainly not as a health system putting the investment or the planning mm -hmm. into it that it needs. The fact that we are here today, you know, within with this group of people, because I think it's really important, because we like to think in silos and a lot of the time act in silos and have policy in silos. And I think it's really important, and as part of that destigmatisation of alcohol, that we start to look at it as a neurological condition mm -hmm. rather than the cause of the underlying cause of the neurological condition. Absolutely, as a country, we need to address our issue and our problematic relationship with alcohol in relation to some of the figures Helen has outlined. But we need to look at the condition that's in front of us. And, you know, I think that today's discussion has been really welcome. And I'd really like to thank Deputy mm -hmm. uh, Pringle in terms of making that uh, proposal that this committee would write formally. And I suppose there are other 
um, ask would have been that you know families themselves to give a sense because they're finding voice in Ireland for the very first time. We haven't just a moral model, we don't have a model. We have no diagnostic specialists and no guidelines in relation to FASD. So we welcome being here and I just want to thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So, uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, and I know you, many of you have made representations to appear before the committee, so uh, we're glad to have been able to accommodate you, and I'd like to thank uh, Senator Dolan for assisting us in organising this meeting. Thank you very much. So, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank the Neurological Society of Ireland, the uh, Disability Federation of Ireland representatives, and the Alcohol Forum for turning up and giving us such excellent evidence this morning. This committee now, not having any further business, is adjourned until next Wednesday morning at 9 a.m.